So, welcome everybody. My name is Jordan Casper, and this is That's So Prototypical. <laughs> one laugh. I get one laugh. You've got my Twitter handle up there. Feel free to heckle me during the talk, because I've got Twitter notifications turned off. I work for a company called Strong Loop. You might have noticed. Strong Loop. We're a sponsor here. Feel free to come by the booth sometime. I'd love to chat to you about Node, because that's what we do. Uh, we are, have five of the top 10 contributors to the Node core. We also help write Express and Loopback, as well as a bunch of DevOps tools for Node. So if you're into Node or you're just curious, feel free to stop by uh, today or tomorrow. So I get this a lot. I thought JavaScript was a functional language. Well, sort of, kind of. So this is, not, this is totally functional, right? This is an add function. And I take in input, and I give out output. And the trick here is the definition of functional. The definition of functional is that given the same input, you're going to get the same output. A truly functional application, each function does not change the state of the world. It changes its inputs into its outputs. So if you can solve a problem purely from a series of function calls with input and output, then you're doing things in a functional manner. I could do that here with add to. However, if you are taking something outside of yourself, and manipulating that thing, and the result is then returned, or even just the result occurs on some object, you are not being functional. This is not a functional add function here. And when we're doing browser development, we're almost entirely not being functional. Now, you can write portions of your application in a functional manner, but you're also operating within a stateful system, the browser. You have a window object. It's got a location object. You've got a document. The document has properties that are static and global. So we're not really operating in a functional setting in the browser. In Node, you can do that a little bit more. But even then, you've got a lot of, of state that is going into this. So when we talk about functional programming, yes, you can do things in a functional way. But ultimately, JavaScript is very object-oriented. So the question is, you know, is it functional? I can do things in a functional way. Or is it object-oriented? And the argument that I would make is that it's a multi-paradigm language. You can do things in JavaScript a lot of different ways, which is great, but it doesn't really help with how do I actually do these things. So we're going to be talking about object orientation. And so the follow-up question to is it functional or object oriented is, is it really object oriented? I mean, really? Because like, there's all these primitive things and JSON objects and, and, and functions all over the place. The thing is, JavaScript is entirely object oriented. Just about everything in JavaScript is an object. Your primitives aren't objects to start, but you always use them in an, in an object-oriented fashion. So when I create a name variable here, I point it to a primitive value, a primitive string. That string is, in fact, primitive. It is immutable. However, when I then try to operate on it, I access properties and methods of that thing. Well, what does that make that thing? It makes it an object. So under the covers, by the way, what's happening is JavaScript is boxing this value. And if you're not familiar with boxing, it basically says, take this primitive create a new capital S string or using that as the argument, and then operate on that boxed object. This is why when you're in something like a for loop, you don't want to be calculating the length of the thing you're operating over every time in the for loop, because JavaScript is very likely boxing that thing for you. Isn't that nice of it? Now, that's gotten much better. Uh, honestly, when it gets interpreted, the efficiencies there have been getting much better over the last year. So it's not terrible, but still. Now, there's your boxing example. So all of these things in JavaScript are operated on as objects. Even our functions are objects. So here I've got a function foo that returns bar. Foo is a variable. Foo has properties, like a name. It's also got a toString method. The toString method returns the entire function definition, including the body of the function. So I've got methods, I've got properties on my functions. And as we move forward in this, in this talk, we're going to see how we kind of exploit that to our benefit. Undefined is really the only thing that cannot be acted on as an object. And the reason I say that is, while you technically can't get any properties or methods off of null, if you do type of null, what do we get? Object. So undefined is kind of the one thing that's really not. Uh, not a number, you could argue also. Infinity actually is. It's a number, of course. So there you go. So we're going to talk about objects today. And we're going to be using this simple object, which is uh, my dog Vincent. And we're going to be using him in all of our examples. So we're going to be doing the, the dog and animal analogy in our, in our examples. So here's a nice, simple dog, a literal dog. 
our little dog has a property of name and a speak method. Everyone's probably already seen something very similar to this. Not terribly exciting, right? Inside of that speak function, of course, this is pointing to the current instance. So uh, this is equivalent, by the way, to just creating a new capital O object and then just assigning some properties to it. Exactly the same thing. In fact, JavaScript under the covers is just taking this and saying, oh, you want an object? Great. Let me create you one and then add some properties to it. So again, inside of that speak method, this is pointing to the current instance. When this points to the current instance, it's pointing to whatever's typically right before the dot. So speak, right before speak is a dot, right before the dot is literal dog. So inside of speak, this is going to point to whatever's before that dot usually. Not always. We can change it. We'll see that in, uh, later on in the slides. But usually, that's what it's going to point to. And we're all pretty familiar with that, I assume. Has anyone here never done anything object-oriented whatsoever and has no idea what object-oriented principles and properties are? OK, great. So why not just always use object literals? I think the answer is somewhat obvious, but let's go ahead and go through them. First of all, a lot of limited reusability, right? You're recreating these things over and over and over again. Li very limited reusability. They're much more difficult to use just in your application code because, again, you have to recreate them all the time. They're very verbose. You don't get, again, that kind of speaks to the reusability, but they're very verbose. And they're really poor abstractions for the actual thing that you're trying to model. So if we're trying to model a dog, Creating a new instance each time from that JSON object is just not a good abstraction. So we're not, really not doing object-oriented programming in that case. So let's talk about object constructors. This is an object constructor. You can see that I've got a function. It's got a capital D for dog. And then it'll accept the name. And then inside of that, it says, well, if you gave me a name, then I'll assign the name to the current instance. And if you didn't give me a name, then that will be unassigned. So it'll be undefined in that case. And I'll assign a function to this.speak. So remember, this is the current instance. So there you go. Very simple constructor. The capital D in dog is purely by convention. You do not need to do that. Every single time you create a function, you've created a constructor. And this is very key to JavaScript's object model, is that it is not classes and instances. I don't care what ES6 says, and I'll harp on that later. We don't have classes. We don't have instances. We have objects. And we create objects from other objects and chain them together. And that's what the rest of this talk is going to be about. So when I create my constructor here, I can create a var v equals new dog, so I can use the new keyword. Notice that I'm just executing this function dog. And now I can do v.speak, and I can create a new dog Brian, and I can do b.speak, and I get the two different results, right? Everyone's probably seen code similar to this. So what did we really create here? We created a function. What did we get from that? I was able to call new on it. So how? Why? What, what went on there? When I log out the dog's prototype, this is what we get. Notice that the prototype only has two things in it. The first thing is the constructor, and the second thing is this underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore. I'll get to that in a minute. Let's focus on this constructor. So what does the constructor point to? The dog function. And the dog function has a what? A prototype? And what does that prototype have? It has a constructor. And where does that constructor point to? The dog function, which has a prototype. Which has, uh, we'll get there. Notice, however, that name and speak, our, our property and our method, aren't on our prototype. So when you think about the prototype and you want to know what it is, you really have to just look at the word itself. Ignore all that you know about computer science and just think about a prototype. If I were to just tell you something is prototypical, what does that mean? It means it's the exemplar. It is what something should look like. It is the example that all others might follow. And that's what a prototype is. It's not a class. It is a prototype. It is what all the other things should start out as, should look like. And so that's really what, we've, what we want here. Notice that that's not really what we have here, because we don't have name and speak on our prototype, which really are part of that, that exemplar. I want to talk briefly about the new keyword here. So I've said new dog with a capital D. And notice that I'm actually executing this function, right? Capital D dog, and I'm executing that function. JavaScript is taking three actions when I do this. The first thing it's doing is creating a new empty object, a completely blank, empty, capital O object. And then it's going to assign a, pro a prototype to that object. So that new object is going to get a new prototype, which is whatever prototype you're passing in through this function call. So it's going to be dog.prototype. And the last thing it's doing is implicitly calling the constructor function on that prototype, or on that new object, but ultimately on the prototype. 
Those are the three actions that it takes, and I can prove it because I can do them myself. I don't need the new keyword to do this thing. And the reason that I point this out is, again, to highlight, we don't have classes. The new keyword is nothing. It is meaningless. The new keyword doesn't do that much. It's just these things, which I can do myself. So I can actually create a new object, object.create, pass in the prototype. That will create me an empty object and then assign the dog prototype to that object. If I don't pass in dog.prototype, I just call object.create, I get a blank, empty, capital O object with the default prototype. The second thing I can do is I can just call v.constructor. It's just a method, like any other method, and I can call it like any other method. And then I could you know, do v.speak, just like I did before. There's actually somewhat of a push in the community to stop using the new keyword and just use this setup. In fact, there are a lot of people that say, don't use the constructor at all. Instead, add an init method or something like that to the prototype and explicitly call that and make the constructor basically a no-op. I don't know that I would go all that way, but there you go. So that's really what's happening. Uh, quick note, object.create does not exist in IE uh, 8 or under, so if you still have to support those, you can't use that. However, there's a shim. It's very easy to, to, to shim in there, so I would encourage you to do that if you, if you have to support this. So we want to make a better dog here, because if you recall, that name and speak stuff was not on our dog prototype, and we kind of want it to be, right? So really easy. I create my dog constructor just like before. I've still got my name checking here, an assignment to the, to the instance. But then down here, I'm going to access the prototype directly. So I'm going to the dog variable, right? Capital D, dog, that variable. And then I'm accessing the prototype attribute of that variable, of that object. That object happens to be a function, but I'm accessing that, proto that property of that object and then adding a new name property onto the prototype. In this case, that basically equals a default value. Notice that I'm also adding a function onto that prototype. When I now create a new dog without a name and I call b.speak, notice that I get bubbles, says woof. In other words, if the name exists, assign it to the instance. But if it doesn't, it's going to use bubbles. So how does it get there? How does that happen? This is what we've now got. Notice my dog prototype has a constructor just like before, which points to the dog function just like before. But now I have name on the prototype and speak on the prototype. Got this other thing, which I'm going to get to in a minute. What's happening is we're creating a fallback mechanism here. We're creating a chain of objects. And we're going to see that when we get to inheritance. But what we're doing is we're creating this chain of objects. So if the instance has that name property, use that. And if it doesn't, fall back to the prototype. And if the prototype doesn't have it, it'll fall back again. Where would it fall back to? Well, it would probably fall back to that underscore, underscore, underscore prototype object. So here, uh, we've got, so this is actually pronounced Dunder Proto. It's a borrowing from the Python world. The Dunder Proto of an instance, if you want to call it that, V, will point to the prototype that created that thing. Uh, you can also do that with object.get prototype of with the variable V, and it will point to dog.prototype. This is, of course, the uh, better way to do it in terms of support. Um, Dunder Proto was actually deprecated at one point, and then undeprecated or replicated? I'm not sure. Anyway, it came back in. It's there now. But you're not encouraged to, uh, you never want to change that. And you, you can access it, but it's kind of discouraged unless you really know what you're doing. So just keep that in mind. If you want to get the pro prototype of a thing, this is the better way to do it. So I'm talking about all these things that we're adding to the prototype and their various levels. So when we talk about object-oriented programming, we talk about various different levels of variables on an object. And if you're coming from Java, PHP, and pretty much any other object-oriented language, you have this idea of various different uh, access types. You have public properties, you have private properties, and you might have something called protected. JavaScript does not have protected. I don't care what you read online. You can't make a protected variable. You just can't. You can kind of fake it through application code, application code that I can override anytime I want. So you can't really create protected variables. It doesn't happen. We can create private, sort of, but they're only accessible through privileged methods, which we'll talk about in a second. So quickly on public method, or public properties, whatever those are, methods or uh, static properties. Anything on the prototype is public. What that means is if I have access to the constructor, dog, then I will have access to those properties, whatever they are. If I have access to an instance, I will have access to any properties that are on the prototype, period. You will always be able to access those. There's no way to lock those down. If they're on the prototype, 
anything that has the instance or the constructor function will be able to access those. Anything that's on the instance is also public. So if I put something on this inside the constructor, for example, or right on, si right on v, in this case, v.human, all of those are going to be public. Anything with access to v is going to be able to access human, and it's going to be able to access fur. There's nothing you can do about that. So let's talk about private variables and privileged methods. So here we go. I've got a private variable. This is my constructor, and I've created a new variable, alive, and I've set it to true. Outside of the constructor function, when I create v, I cannot access alive. I cannot say v.alive and get access to that. It will be undefined. So great, I've created a private variable inside of dog. Isn't that lovely? Can't ever use it, but isn't that lovely? So we need to be able to access that private variable. So how can we do that? We do that through privileged methods. Inside the constructor, I'm going to create two new methods. One to check whether something is alive, which just returns that alive variable, and one to kill the thing by setting alive to false. Notice that there's no live function, no zombie dogs here. So I've got these two functions. Now, what's important to note here is that both of these functions are created in the constructor. Why is that important? Somebody knows. Because of closures, yes. The reason that these two functions can access the alive variable is because they are closures. It is because they are created within the scope of another function. So let's take a quick uh, tangent onto closures. So I've got my global scope here. And then inside of that global scope, I've got a variable called JK. And I'm not just kidding. Those are my initials. And it's an object, right? Now, also in the global scope, I've got a function foo. Now, the function foo, inside of foo, it declares a variable x. Now, nothing outside of the red box, outside of foo, can access x, right? So I create a function inside of the red box. Anything created inside of the red box will be able to access anything inside the red box for as long as it exists. So jk.privy equals function. In other words, I'm placing the blue box on jk, which is outside of the red box. But that's OK, because the function was created inside the red box. So for all time, the blue box will be able to access x. Now I create another function called bar. Bar is this green box over here. And notice that it's outside of the red box. What does that mean? It means it cannot access x, period, ever. Cannot do that. However, the green box has access to jk. And jk has privy on it. And privy is privy to x because it's a closure inside of the red box. So because the green box can access the blue box, jk.privy, it can, by association, access the, the private x variable. So that's the nature of a closure, is that this internal function maintains its scope that it was created within for all time. So back to our example, these two functions, because they are created within the constructor, will always, for all time, have access to everything that was in scope at the time they were created, which includes this alive variable. Solid? Great. So now I can use that, right? So I can create a new dog v. I can do v.isalive. It's true. I can do v.die. Uh, and it sets that, that private variable to false. And now v.isalive is false. Notice that if I try and access v.alive, it will still be undefined, right? Alive does not exist on that object. It only exists within the confines of this constructor function. OK. A couple other notes. If I were to create a kill function on the prototype, which is public and not privileged, right? It's not inside the constructor function. Then this dot alive, I could set it equal to false. OK, fine, you can do that. But when I kill the dog and then I check is alive, is alive is still true. Why? Because I'm not accessing the same variable. This variable, this.alive, is a completely different variable. Yes, they happen to have the same name, but they are completely different variables in different contexts. OK. So those are privileged methods. Let's talk about static methods. These are easy. Here's my dog function. On my dog function, I can just add properties. Remember, functions are objects. So I can just load them up with whatever I want. So on my dog function object, I'm going to add a property called genus. By convention, if it's a static thing, a lot of times we capitalize the whole thing. Not necessary, but very common. 
So I've made genus canis, and note I've, notice I've created a function on my function. Dog.mergeBreeds is a function which will take in two breeds and then do whatever you have to do to merge them and then return the result. That's how you merge breeds, right? I don't know. I never got that talk. So, <laughs> so anywhere where I can access the capital D dog object, that function, I can access those static things, whatever's on there. Quick notes on those, though. You have to be a little careful, right? So there's my usage of them. You have to be a little careful. If I create a get name variable or a function like this, dog.getName, and inside of get name, I return this.name, that function will execute just fine. What will it return? Does anyone want to take a guess on what name exactly it's returning? The prototype name? Like what? So the question, of course, here is, what does this point to? I've already told you what this always points to. What does this point to? The thing before the dot. What's before the dot? Dog. What is dog? A function. What is the name property of that function object? Dog. This will always and forever return the string dog. It will never return the name of Vincent or Bubbles or whatever else you want to put in there, ever. So you have to be careful when you're doing static methods, never try and use this in there, or make sure you're changing the context that the function is executing within, which we'll see in a little bit. OK, so there we go. Oh, yeah, and if you uh, try to call get name on an instance method, you'll actually get a reference error, right? Because get name does not exist on v. It exists on dog. And those two things are completely different. Yes, one was created from the prototype of the other, but they are completely disparate things. OK. So I know you're all really here to hear about inheritance and the prototype, and so that's what we're going to talk about now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that alive thing that we had and abstract it up to an animal object. Notice I've just created another constructor, right? So I've got my animal constructor now, capital A. And it's got a private alive variable. And it's got a two privileged methods in it, right? And now I've got my dog function. Now the first thing I'm going to do in my dog function is I'm going to call the parent constructor. Now to call the parent constructor in ES5 or lower, I need to do animal. I need to call the animal function. Uh, we do have access to super in ES6, but I digress. Whole thing on that, which I'm not going to get into right now. If I just called the animal function, just animal open parentheses, close parentheses, what would be this inside of animal? Anyone want to take a guess? If I just say animal open parentheses, close parentheses. If you're in a browser, it would be a little louder. If you're in a browser, it would be the window. It would be the global context, whatever that happens to be. Because I'm not executing it with anything in front, right? There's no, it's not something dot animal, open parentheses, close parentheses. It's just animal, just like I was calling the function from anywhere else. So what I need to do is switch the context that this function, the animal constructor, operates within. To do that, I have two methods, apply and call. They are exactly equivalent, with one exception, which is the second argument. So the first argument is always the context that you want that function to operate within. So inside of animal, I want this inside of animal to point to the same thing that this points to inside of dog. Does that make sense? Inside of the dog constructor, this points to my new dog. Inside of animal, I want this to point to my new dog. Make sense? So I'm switching the context that the animal function is going to execute within to this, which will be the new dog instance. And then I could add onto that any other properties. We'll see that in a minute, so I'm going to hold off on that. Uh, call and apply in this case would literally operate exactly the same, and there's absolutely no difference. The only difference is when you pass arguments into it, which we'll see in a minute. Notice I do the same thing, if name, then this.name equals name. And here's where the magic happens. I need to change what the dog's prototype points to. So by default, the dog constructor prototype is going to be whatever the dog prototype is. But what I want to do is have the dog's prototype go up the chain. I want the dog's prototype to point to the animal prototype. You remember that fallback mechanism we were talking about? That's what we're creating here. We're creating this fallback mechanism. What we want to say is if it's on the dog instance, like this.name, then use that. 
If not, go up. Fall back up to the dog's prototype. And if it's there, use that. Well, what's up from the dog's prototype? What's up a level from the dog's prototype is the animal prototype. So notice I'm creating a new empty object whose prototype is the animal prototype. So remember, empty object, and that empty object's prototype, so one up from it, is the animal prototype. That thing becomes the dog prototype. That's how we create that chain. However, when I do that, if when I create an empty object whose prototype is the animal prototype, what is the constructor function for that new prototype going to be? Anyone want to shout it out? If I create an empty object whose prototype is animal, what will the constructor function point to? Animal. However, the dog's constructor function is not animal. It's dog. So I need to switch the constructor function back to dog. Yes? Otherwise, it'll point to animal. And then I do all the things I did before. Dog.prototype.name, dog.prototype.speak, and go on from there. Yes? So this is what we've got. I create a new dog v. I do console.log v, the instance, right? The instance of dog. When I do that, the dog has a name property on the instance, on v. But it also has a dunder proto, so its prototype is that dog constructor function prototype, right? So that dog prototype has its own constructor. Notice it points to the dog function like we wanted. It also has the name and the speak methods on it. And then it's got its own dunder proto property, which points to animal. Now, animal has its own constructor function, which points to the animal constructor function. And it's got its own dunder, pro dunder proto property, which points to object, capital O object, the big O, right? And of course, I could have as many layers there as I need. Again, what's happening here is a fallback mechanism. I go to V, and I want to know the name of this dog. Is it on the instance? Yes, use it. Great. OK, now I want to call the speak method. Is it on the instance? No. So what does it do? It falls back to dunder proto. Is it there? Yep, there it is. So what if I call v.toString? What's going to happen? It's going to fall back one level to the prototype. Nope. One level to the animal prototype. Nope. One level to the object prototype. Is it there? Yep, there it is. It's just a fallback mechanism. There's no class system. It is a, a chain of objects. And it just goes back and back and back until it hits nothing, in which case you get a reference error. So for those of you that don't like looking at code and you're more visual, here's the visual representation of this. <clears throat> so at the bottom of the chart, we have our instance, Vincent. Vincent is an instance which has a prototype. That prototype points to the dog.prototype, which has a constructor function, which points to the dog constructor function. The dog constructor function has a prototype, which points to the dog prototype. The dog prototype has a prototype, which points to the animal prototype. The animal prototype has a constructor function, which points to the animal constructor function, which has a prototype, which points to the animal prototype. The animal prototype has a prototype, which points to the object prototype, which has a constructor function, which is the object constructor function, of course, and points to, has a prototype, which points back to the object prototype. Yes? We're all good there? Do you need me to do it again? No? OK. So I did a talk once, 20 minutes, on how the internet works. It was all that. <laughs> I needed four lozenges afterward. So I've got uh, var v equals new dog Vincent. And if you want to check what it is, I can use instance of. So I can do v instance of dog, capital D dog, which is just checking whether that prototype created that thing. And it did, so I get true. Notice that if I do v instance of animal, that will also be true, because it's checking that prototype chain. I can also do v instance of object. At the bottom, you can see I can go the other way. So I can say, go to the dog's prototype and say, are you the prototype of v? Is prototype of? So you can go either direction there, and you'll get those, those, those cases. So uh, what you don't want to do is use type of. What is type of v? Anyone? Object. Not helpful. So use instance of, or use more properly, uh, go to the prototype and check is prototype of to that thing. Yes? Questions there? You guys are all experts now? Or you're just all stunned? You're all stunned. That's OK. I'll, I'll let it go. OK, so let's talk about polymorphism and uh, calling parent methods. And this one's a, a little tricky. Probably not as tricky as, as, as closures, but it's a little tricky. So I've got this animal object, right? And let's presume that I add age into the mix. So the animal has an age. 
Not all animals have names. You've got farm animals, you don't want to name those, and we know why. So you've got ages, though. Ages are, are perpetual. They're on everything. So I say if age, then this.age equals age, just like we did with the name. And outside of that, you can see that I've got a default age of 1. And just for funsies, I added a method called getAge on the animal, which just returns the age. The reason I'm doing that is because, as we all know, dogs age about seven years for every human year in terms of the, the conversion factor. So if I wanted to always return get age in human years, then I could override this get age method in order to always return human years. So I've got my dog function just like before, but notice that I do need to take in name and age, right? Not just name, but I need to take in name and age. And now you can see I've got animal.apply. This, which is the dog instance that I'm passing up to the animal constructor to change the context. And then the second argument is an array. In this case, it's an array with all of the arguments that I want to pass into the age func or I'm sorry, the animal function. So the difference between apply and call here is in apply, I pass these in as an array. In call, I pass them in as a spread, where I just say this, and then it would be age, comma, argument two, comma, argument three, comma, argument four, with no array syntax. That's the, literally the only difference between apply and call. Under the covers, they do the exact same thing. I have no idea why they both exist. Good? So I've got my dog set up. I've got my animal set up. And now I want to override that get age method. So to override the get age method, I create it on the dog prototype. And I call the animal prototype method first. Now remember, I have to switch the context still. If I do animal.prototype.getAge, open parentheses, close parentheses, what will be this inside of get age? Huh? If I just do animal.prototype.getAge, open parentheses, close parentheses, what is this inside of get age? Close? No? Animal.prototype. Right? It's the thing right before the dot. Not helpful, though. It's not helpful in there. So I switch the context, and I call get age with the current dog instead. That gets me the raw age, if you will, the age of the animal. Now I just return age times 7, which is about how long dogs age in human years. So now when I create my new dog v and I call v.getAge, I will get 70 instead of 7, which is the, the raw age. Yes? So our polymorphism comes from being able to do this parent method call right here. The dog.prototype get age is on the dog prototype, right? So when I call v.getAge, because dogs have a getAge method on their own prototype, I never reach the animal getAge method. If this didn't exist, if dog.prototype.age didn't exist, I could still call v.getAge. It would go up from the instance to the dog prototype, but it wouldn't exist. So it would fall back again to the animal prototype, where it does exist and would be called and executed. Yes? Fallback mechanism. It's just a chain of objects, and you're just falling back from one level to the next. I know I've been harping on it, but that's the whole point I'm trying to get across, is that's all that prototypical inheritance is. It's just a chain of objects that you fall back from. OK, so interfaces are actually really, really easy. They're just objects with properties on them that you apply to a prototype. So here's my mix-in. I've got a domesticated mix-in. You can see it's just a simple object, right? It's got one property on it, which is happiness, and it's got one method, lick face. And for, why are you laughing? For, for every time that this animal licks my face, it gets happier. Notice, the animal gets happier, right? This, not, not the human. The animal gets happier, which is true. So I'm going to take this set of things properties, methods, whatever it is. I want to take this set of things, and all I want to do is be able to apply them in multiple places, right? So an interface allows you to say, I've got two things that do not inherit from each other, but share properties. And so I want those properties to be shared among both, and I don't want to have to recreate it both times, right? I could just put these things on my dog and on my cat and on whatever other animal, but I don't want to inherit from this because it's not an inheritance relationship. So all I need to do is copy those properties from that object, from that, that, that mix-in, onto my prototype. When you do this, do not do it yourself. Use a helper method. Do not simply loop over that object and copy everything onto the prototype. Why wouldn't I do that? Someone knows. What will I copy in addition to happiness and lick face? 
to string. Constructor not, thankfully, because it's not iterable. But anything else that is on the parent object of this thing would also get copied over. So instead, just use a helper method. It's super easy. jQuery, underscore, Angular, they all have an extend method. Prototype.js has an object.extend. Backbone has model.extend. Dojo has lang.mixin or lang.extend. Any language you're in, if you're in Node, you uh, require the util method. It's util.inherits. All of this, these, these frameworks have some method to do this. Use one of them. So for me, I'm just going to use jQuery. So I've got my animal and I've got my dog. And here's my domesticated trait, or my mixin. I do dollar sign dot extend. I pass in the dog prototype and my domesticated object, that mixin. So everything that's in domesticated at one at the, the, the lower level, right? Not anything above it, but just at the domesticated level, will get copied onto the dog prototype. By the way, if I already had dogs in existence that were created from this prototype, they would immediately have access to all of the domesticated functionality. Right? Because the prototype is just an object. And if, that, uh, if the objects that were created from that object need to reference something, they're going to go back to the prototype, the dog.prototype, and now that dog.prototype has domesticated attributes. So there's no, there's no like set class. That, that, that prototype can change at any point in time. Yeah? All right. So there's using my mix in. I create a new dog. V.happiness is one. He calls the face five times, and now it's six. So very simple interfaces. In case you're curious, if you're coming from another object-oriented uh, language, we don't really have um, abstract classes. Abstract classes are a way to basically create a contract that says, here's my abstract. Anything that implements the abstract must implement these things, period. Otherwise, it is not valid code and will fail a, a syntax um, check. We don't have that in JavaScript. It does not exist. Yes, you can create some application code that will check that for you. But that's application code. There's nothing in the language syntax, in the structure, that will allow you to have anything like abstracts that you would have in Java or PHP or any other language. So uh, I'm ending a little bit early. So my rant on ES6 in classes might go long. Just warning you now. So this is the syntax for ES6. If you've been to any of the uh, ES6 talks, you might have seen some of this. Uh, you can see that we get a few new keywords. We get the class keyword. We also get the extends keyword. So I can create a new <coughs> class called dog, and it can extend animal. And then you can see that I've got a new block here. This is creating a new block scope. And then I don't actually use object syntax. I just say constructor and speak and get age. Inside of each of these methods, I can use super. So I can say super here to call the, constru the parent constructor method for uh, dog, which of course would be animal, just like before. Um, I can also create things like this down here. This is actually ES5, not ES6. So I can create getters and setters in here, which are great. So anytime someone tries to access uh, v.name, it will actually access this method and execute it, and then return underscore name. That allows me to kind of abstract those things and keep those variables somewhat private instead. But notice it's still this dot underscore name, which means it's public. Anyone can access underscore name. If you really want to do this, you actually need to use object.define property. And inside of define property, you have to create that thing as a frozen thing that is immutable. And then you would have to do a bunch of other stuff. And it's a whole, a whole rigmarole. And I can also do a setter. So when I do v.name equals something, it would actually call this function and do that setting. But again, I could always access this dot underscore name. This block, while it does sort of create a scope, it does not create a scope in which you can create variables. So I can still not create private variables this way. I would still have to create them within the constructor function or within some other function in this block. And down at the bottom, you can see that, really, I can only use this thing for methods. If I want to create default properties, I still have to go to dog.prototype.underscore_name equals bubbles. I cannot put properties in this thing. I have no idea why. It's the stupidest thing in the world. It's not that hard. I can create methods. Why not properties? But you can't. So what's happening here? Nothing different than you already know. What does class dog extends animal do? It does exactly what I just showed you. There's absolutely no difference between what class dog extends animal does than what we just did with the prototype. Under the covers, that is exactly what JavaScript is doing. And the reason I'm telling you this is this is confusing. We don't have classes. We have prototypical chains. 
And that's what you need to understand because when you start getting bugs in your code, when you have a 20,000 line application that has all sorts of different objects in it, what you need to know is how do I debug prototypes? And you don't debug prototypes by reverting to classes. That's not going to be helpful for you. So I just want you to understand when you start using this syntax, because I know a lot of you will, that you're still working with prototypes. And you need to understand prototypical inheritance in order to be able to understand what's going on with this new syntax. This is just sugar. And in my opinion, it's just going to cause more confusion. Angle bracket slash ran. Last thing, please don't use a framework. Please, please, or please don't write a framework. Please use an existing framework. All sorts of frameworks. Please do not write a framework. Use a framework. All sorts of little frameworks. Little mini frameworks, middleweight frameworks, heavyweight frameworks. ext.js is actually commercial, but it actually has a solid class library. Use some framework. I don't care what it is. Just use something. Do not deal with prototypes yourself. It is really annoying and cumbersome and prone to errors. So use a framework. It makes things 10 times easier. That's it. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, that's so prototypical. The slide's here, jordancasper.com slash prototypical. And you've got my Twitter handle. Feel free to yell at me and tell me that I suck and I'm horrible and that ES6 classes are the best thing ever. Otherwise, feel free to come find me um, afterward at the happy hour or tomorrow I'll be at the Strong Loop booth. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. When I'm accessing the prototype, because it's not in the constructor, how do I keep all that organized? Yeah. Use a framework. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize, but honestly, that's a, like the code that you saw where I had dog constructor function, and then immediately under that, I have dog.prototype, dog.prototype, dog.prototype. That's what you do. So you put that in one file, and that is your dog module, or model, or whatever you want to call it, right? That is the file that defines dog. So if I was in Node, I would define it in there, and then I would export the dog function. If I were in something like require, I would have the export from the require module be the dog constructor function, and everything would be in that one module. So yeah, that's how I would do it. Other questions? No? Hmm. Use a framework. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. It's just. It's just. It's just. <laughs> yeah. You know. Uh, so the question is, if I was doing like that interface example where I wanted to copy domesticated onto my dog, and I I'm not using any other frameworks, so can I just use object dot has own property and copy those properties over? Yes, that would be exactly how you would do it. But I would wonder what application you're writing that uses literally zero frameworks. Like, what is it? I'm, I'm really honestly curious what you might write. Yeah, because like, I don't know a single person that doesn't use at least one of some kind of framework. And almost all of them have that because they use it internally. So they might as well expose it for you to use as well. Is that all the immutable frameworks for them? Or are there more to it than the functions? No, no. They, so there, a couple of them do a couple of other neat things. But no, most of it is just looping over with has own property. Um, if you, you can, I mean, you can go and inspect the jQuery or the underscore code. They're, Almost entirely that. They do a couple of things, but no, that's mostly it. Can mixins override existing properties? Can mixins override existing properties? On the prototype, absolutely. JavaScript will let you do lots of stupid things. I mean, the, so the problem is you don't know necessarily, right? right. If, you, if a class is given to you and you're tasked with applying a mixin to that class, yeah, you could override things on that prototype. But you know, you've got to weigh that against uh, you know, having good documentation and understanding your application code base and, and all that other stuff. So, I mean, you could do that in any case, right? You could have um, a Java class and you could extend that Java class with your own class and completely override one of the public methods on that Java class. Like, there's nothing to prevent you from doing that. You're not going to get a warning in the console or anything. So, others? All right, go, play, drink, have fun. <laughs>